Uh, all right. All right. Smoking lots of shit Before he died It was Jim Morrison's last wish Okay, well we could play that whole thing But that would go on and on and on on. That's a pretty long song So, (laughs) welcome everyone to another night of us Just hanging out with John Walsh Talking about movies Yeah Yay, hi guys Hold on a second So, hello John How's Hello. it been going? It's been going pretty, pretty neato. As... So I, I wanted to know if you could, if we could all do our best John Fetterman impersonation. Uh, 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 uh. Mine is my avatar is doing my John Fetterman impression. Incredibly <laughs> blank nothingness. That was pathetic. That, I mean, I, I remember after I talked to you, I watched it again, the whole thing, and I was just like. We are no longer a serious country. Just that all by itself. Well, uh, Kat, today, uh, Senator John Fetterman, who had a stroke before he uh, became during the election campaign, Mm -hmm. got up and decided to uh, shout at a banker. Okay. At a hearing and um, spewed out just one long, incoherent ramble. And then just stared at the guy like he wanted an answer. Yeah. It was like like when one of those homeless people come up to you and and Bigfoot lives in the um and you know, well. And and you know what the, and you know what the biggest problem was is that um anyone who is spoken to like that should say uh with uh, all uh respect, not saying it's due respect, Senator, you are not fit to be in this building. You should resign for the good of your constituents. But we don't do that in this country anymore. Newsweek's trying to claim that it was a joke. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was <laughs> like if you, I mean, in the broad sense, John Fetterman, yeah, he is. Sorry to bring it down. I was just that, that, that thing just, it's so, I don't know why it annoyed me so much, but it did. It's because it's there at all. It yeah. is. It's because the Senate, because the Senate is full of old women and fools. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. And old women fools, and uh, and California has a senator who should belongs in a in a morgue somewhere, because she oh, yeah. she, she looks like she looks like death warmed over. Really. And apparently, Didn't know where she was. Yeah, when they when her, when her when her when her people rolled her in, apparently she said, "Where are we?" Oh, that, that's my not a joke. Uh, Look, just enough already. Die. <laughs> just fucking die I, I think it's hilarious that the Democrats are uh, trying to introduce um, limit term limits for this uh, for the Supreme Court and it's like well two things one uh, the reason there were no there's no term limits because that's how that is like kills corruption is the idea that's one of the that's one aspect of it and two uh, why don't you uh, give us an example of that? The, the Senate, the Senate should say we're going to do that from now on. Only two terms. They wouldn't do that. And they all say, and people I don't said, want "Well, my well, job, uh, you know, to be in danger." No. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, and, and nothing. I mean, that woman has been there for so long, and everyone who goes in there comes out rich. Strangely enough, yeah. there was a video that surfaced of Joe Biden. Uh, in 2018, uh, doing one of his that that creepy thing he does when he tries to make everybody laugh and he fails miserably, and he and he's talking about how he only makes uh, 
take takes home like the you know the, the pay that comes from the senate no oh, joe you this joe you that it's like you know he wants you to applaud for him while he was saying that he knew that his bank account was in like the 10 million dollar range because of uh all of his back deals and uh and his and his family and he had the balls to stand up there begging well, for applause for that we all know that uh the government's corrupt as fuck, and the Democrats are the worst of the worst. So let's talk about movies. Yay! <laughs> Tell Thank me about you. movies, John. Movies. What movies. is a movie that we should all see that nobody's seen? Wow! It just it just so happens that I <clears throat> I pulled a bunch of things off, and I'm gonna. I actually have a few of those. Actually, I have a few in this pile that you probably haven't heard of. <clears throat> have you ever heard of a film called? deranged from I'm trying to, uh, what year was this? 1974? 1974 well let me pull that on screen your screen there you go okay deranged 1974 yep and you, and if you you see that guy you when you the um picture underneath the um the top block that shows um the, the guy yeah. right there right he, you probably don't know him from that but you will if you see an older picture of him you would recognize him because he's been in he's one of those people who's been in ten thousand things over the years and this is the only movie that he was a star in what it is is the <clears throat> it's the first movie that really looks at the ed gein story um oh really from, like the facts but I mean, it's not a, it's not a docu it's not a docu dry. It is a, it's a movie. It's a horror movie, but uh, <laughs> it's it, it it's it shows you you know where he lives out in the woods and everything like that. And then and then and this happens several times in the movie. There's a narrator, and the narrator steps into the scene and like breaks the fourth wall while the scene is going on behind him. Like Rod Serling. Yes, that that's perfect. That's a, yeah. But he's doing it for your approval. during the movie, though. And it sounds like it wouldn't work, but it works. Okay, everyone. For those of you unaware, Ed Gein <laughs> is a pretty notorious guy. If you know anything about serial killers, Ed Gein, well, he was the inspiration for Leatherface mm -hmm. and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Ed Gein was... Oh, and uh, and um, Psycho. 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 Yeah. But, you know, I think Psycho was a very, very... Um, charitable yeah yeah depiction you know, they made norman a very uh, complicated person ed was not a complicated person he was a three-toothed redneck who lived out in the middle of the woods who went out killed people and turned them into furniture yes and it was mm -hmm. only because he lived in an, out in the middle of nowhere in a small town that it took so long to catch him and and if you're looking at the screen now you see one of the reasons i like it is that you get that 70s 16 millimeter blown up to 35 look I, I i which i totally dig <laughs> you know it's it's gritty but you can still tell what's going on so there have been movies made about uh you know ed guy and uh, mm -hmm. before and you know some of them are very exploitive is there like how closely to the actual story or the actual you know the actual events yeah. does this stay well i'll put it this way <clears throat> i'm not an expert on it Gein by keen or guy whoever it's pronounced mm -hmm. but um i'm not an expert on it. but <clears throat> this had a lot of points in it where i i could connect it to the actual f events so i think they tried to like make it happen a little more um a little uh, I was saying simple makes it sound dumbed down, which it's not because I think, I think it, I mean, just look at the faces of some of these people. It's yeah. like, mm -hmm. this is no, this, that ain't Janet Lee on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. It's, no. <laughs> and, and this guy, his name is Roberts Blossom. And he, like I said, he's been in a gazillion things and he just, he's just, he's just right for this. I, it's like, I looked at it when last time I looked at this, I thought, today or no if like someone else got a hold of this movie like roger corman he would have had like vincent price play that part and it's like since you 
I mean, just look at the guy's eyes. It's like he was built for this. <laughs> and he, and well, he's a good it's a good acting. He's a good actor. Well, let's make a comparison. Here's the real Ed. Yeah, that's the real Ed guy. Hmm. That's not bad. I think yeah. I think Blossom, I mean, because, you know, who cares really if he looks like him facially, but the eyes. I mean, look at those eyes. Holy crap. I oh. think it's a de decent likeness. You know, yeah. this is not a handsome person by any means. Right. No. He gives you the feel. Because I'm, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I am like, um, when people complain about accuracy, it's like, okay, the most accurate, dramatic movie of a real situation is nothing like that real situation. No. I mean, nothing like it. <laughs> people don't go to the bathroom. <laughs> people don't think. They're on slow. You know, it's so, I, I, doesn't, I don't get that. But just having seen this, I was like, I don't need to see any more movies about this guy. I think I really yeah. got the gist of it. Well, here's a fun little fact about Ed Gein, or Gein, <laughs> whatever the hell his name is. Fun, I always thought it was Gein. So. Fun, fun fact Probably about is. this guy, uh, other than the fact that it is only because he was in the middle of nowhere in a tiny hick town that he didn't get caught sooner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, after, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. After he got caught, somebody in New York bought his car. And for a number of years, as a tourist thing, you yeah. could pay to take a ride in Ed's car. <laughs> wow. In New York. I did not know that. You got to sit in the back yeah. seat and hear all about who was in the back seat and who got killed there. <laughs> oh, my God. See, uh, for some reason, I thought of John Waters. It's like something he would do. <laughs> oh, also, uh, uh, Ed, Ed Gein was also one, one of the uh, inspirations for uh, Buffalo Bill for uh, um, mm -hmm. Silence of the Lambs because right. he was making himself a lady suit. So Yes. Wow. You know, nowadays, they would probably just say that, you know, he's he's a normal transvestite. <laughs> yeah, and it's our fault <clears throat> because yeah. we don't allow him to blah, blah, blah. But yeah. anyway. Yeah, see, this guy here, he's just normal. It, it's just his preference. It, you know, it's, it's a legitimate it's, sexuality. It's, everyone. it's a really well-handled uh, movie and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I, I, I suspect, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect um, when it was made, the only movie they were thinking about is Psycho, like in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, comparison. I don't think he, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not, like, I don't think this is, um, I don't think they copied of uh, Texas Chainsaw, which I don't think was even out at the time. Um, maybe it was, I can't remember the date, but uh, this and Texas Chainsaw, by the way, would make a very good double feature. Oh, uh, yeah, I bet. Because they're not similar. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's very similar background, but they're, they're both made very differently. And Texas Chainsaw should be the uh, the A feature because at the end of that, you just, you're just worn out. <laughs> In a good way. So so how how, how does this compare to Henry Port Portrait of a Serial Killer? Because um, that's another one of those films where people, after they yeah. see it, react. Uh, Henry is Henry. Uh, if you take Texas Chainsaw out, because it's you know it, I I think it's it takes a couple of points from it. It isn't trying to be the Ed Gein story. If you take that out of it, um, Henry is my number one. Yeah. Um. I was I was, <clears throat> I think I was around twenty when I saw it, and I had a friend who was really into like Fangoria and stuff, and he made me very like, oh my god, this is this is so dark and it's so good. And when I saw it, I was like, I was not grossed out by it. It's it was something different. It was like I was chilled, like from beginning to end. I, you know, I thought it's, it's going to get stupid soon, and it never well, did. <clears throat> everything in that film is implied, right? It's not really that gory, yeah, except for the television set. <laughs> yeah. And I still think it has one of the very best um, final shots of any horror movie. Yeah. Do you remember what it is? No. All right. So uh, everyone who hasn't seen it, you know, it, put, cover your ears to the count of five. He, um, he, pull, uh, Henry pulls up the car and off the side of the highway and he takes out a very heavy um, uh, uh, piece of luggage and drops it there. Then he gets in the car and the car goes away. And this whole time the camera is still just still on this piece of luggage by the side of the highway. And it's the girl, it's the 
the other guy's sister. That's who's in there. Mm. It, and it's like, and th- I think that shot is perfect because it's like we see that happen, and then we see the car go, but the camera is a move, implying, and he's gone. You don't know where he's going to go next. Plug it in, Otis. That and the other, my, but my, my, my the, another um, fantastic final shot is um, the Long Good Friday with Bob Hoskins, which is a uh, British uh, crime movie, and. I'm not even going to describe the last shot. It's just, it's, it's the perfect ending shot to a crime, a a story about a guy who's in the mob and his guys are getting picked off one by one. And he's just like, who is doing this to me? So like he sends his guys out to, you know, beat these people up, beat those people up and his people keep getting knocked off. That's the setup for that. I would, that was, I wasn't going to talk about that tonight, but since it came up, you should see the, the long, good Friday. It's the movie that first put Bob Hoskins on the map. Really? I didn't know that. Neither did I. Helen Mirren plays his uh, girlfriend. Oh, wow. This is like 1980, I think it is. 80 or 81. Yeah. Um, so, so being that you are such a film connoisseur, John, I, I, I just have to ask, when are you writing another book about movies? Oh, um, I mean, I if think... you look on the screen right now, you've already written one about all of the alien films. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you yes. include? Did you include uh, the uh, Gibson script in that? I forget. I, I, I read. I, did not. I, read I think book, I, but... I mentioned it. I think, but I didn't really go on about it. Have you heard <clears> the because audio? Because the, then the thing would have been another. You know, this this edition is three times the size of the first edition, and I was like, it's got to stop somewhere. So did after you hear I... the audio. No. Oh, there's a decent audio drama that's the Gibson script. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Um and they did did they and they did a graphic novel of it too, didn't they? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um no, because I mean I have the script. So ah. so yeah, but I uh I got it in this funky little store in Harvard Square. So um, so the initial question, cool. when are yeah. you going to write another book about movies since I don't know, I got to think. Man. I I I uh, well, thank you very much for asking, but um I don't know. I don't, I mean, right now I'm working on my big giant project, which I said I was going to have done like a year ago and it's not done yet, but it's getting, Gosh, I don't know nothing like I've never done anything <laughs> like that. I didn't, I, I can't relate, but um, I'm, I mean, that was a subject. The alien was a subject matter. I just had to get out of my head, you know, and um, I, we all have those subjects. <laughs> well, I know you do. And um, I just, um, I don't know. I, I don't know what, I I was I have a, a vague idea about a um a book about science fiction writers um but I don't I don't know if I'm gonna I might just turn that into some excuse me some uh, you know some blog articles about uh, like Lay Brackett and a couple of other uh, science fiction writers who just happen to be women and I mean that literally what I just said it, they just happen to be women it's like it's a it's like you know if they have a bunch of males and you know me I'm not you know a feminist but it, it's just I, I think that they have not got certain people have not gotten their due um they've been because you know they've been used yeah. by certain other people mary and zimmer bradley will not be in this book by the way <laughs> <laughs> so Bye. well she has been used <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so actually just since this is the movie uh we're talking movies what was the obsession that made you write a book about all of the alien sequels? It was, the, uh, it, it's okay. I, I, I was 13 when I saw it opening week in Boston in a theater full of adults packed, sold out full of adults. I was like the only kid there and I had been into science fiction really big for like three or four years, you know, star log comic books, all that whole thing. And they really went heavy on alien in the magazines. If, if the people who did the publicity for alien included Charles Lippincott, who was the guy who he came up with the idea of guys, we have to go to the science fiction conventions with this star Wars movie. I'm telling you, it's going to work. And they're like, I don't know. And he pushed them to like really push Star Wars um, advertising. And then he did Alien. I bet if he had a choice, if he went back now, 
they had the pictures of the alien in Starlog three months before the movie came out. And it's, you know, <laughs> there it is. It's like, but, but you should not show that in a magazine. You should no. wait till people see it in the movie. Having said that, and I bought everything I could possibly get my hands on about that movie. So when I saw it, it's still one of the only three or four times I had huge expectations for a movie and it beat those expectations. Um, I just remember very vividly the scenes where they first land on the planet. And if you watch that, um, there's, you can hear the breathing and Jerry Goldsmith's score, which is phenomenal. Just very simple. It's like if the flute, it's just a flute thing, some echoes, right? And when you see the alien ship, I noticed two things happened. One, I thought, mm, yeah, let's get out of here. We don't have to go in there. That's okay. Let's not go in there. And two, the other thing I remembered was the theater was dead silent. Yeah. It's the first time I got the feeling that everyone in the audience was going, what the hell is that? They were completely inside the movie. The um, chest burster. After that, you, you could see people getting up and leaving. And that was like, <laughs> that was like oh, I was like, this is the greatest movie ever made. And one other thing, which I don't hear people talk about this <clears throat> a lot. Remember how the thing is they think they're getting trying to find the chest burster. So they have the net and they go and the cat gets away. And they stupidly mm -hmm. tell Harry Dean Stan to go wander off himself, right? And they really stretch the tension. They, you know, the camera just is moving through that chamber with the water coming down. And then he sees the cat. And you're, you're I think you're, you're like, there's a, I don't know if it, I think there's a part of your mind that you've paid money to see a movie and there's a part of you that doesn't want to be taken in by it. It's like, a, it's like a positive negative thing. It's kind of like where I think a lot of the people who enjoy bashing movies come from. You know what I mean? It's like they said this is going to be scary, and now you're scared. <laughs> and you know, it was delivering on what it promised. And the thing I always remember is when Harry Dean Stanton is in the is in the floor, the front of the shot, and the alien comes down behind him, and he's and it's blurry. You can't yeah. really see it. And the music, and again, this is one of the first scores by Jerry Goldsmith that made me love his music forever. It does this strange, like vibrating thing. And then <laughs> it does this thing with the, um, the strings and like, like, I think it's just, just a, this, a few strings. And it's, it, it's, it's like the music goes going, is going, wait a minute. What is this? Like when he, when the creature came, it didn't like blast out with trombones. Right. It was just this like, that's, that's almost what the things that this, the, the percussion sounded like. And then they show the thing. And the, if you listen to the music, it's just like, it's like the music is backing up. And so when the thing finally puts its thing through his head, you're just like, I'm not quite sure what I saw, but it's, it's like, it, it like, it's like, um, yeah, Fikoto says this, this thing is huge. <laughs> and that, that was the scene I think that really got me. Obviously the other scenes did, but that scene, I was just like, this, this thing is beyond their control. These people are dead. Well, the other thing I would bring up, uh, just as my memory of Alien, yeah, was one summer I was went to this summer arts program at Cal Arts, no less, for writing. Oh, and every night they would show movies in the theater on campus, and they were, were going to do back to back Alien and Aliens. Now, mm -hmm. almost everybody in the theater had only seen Aliens, and that's what they right. were expecting, right? And you know, a bunch of snotty high school kids. Um, through mo usually when you saw a movie there during the summer program, the students, all the people in the audience just would not shut the hell up. Right. They're constantly, uh, you know, laughing and hooting at the film and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. making jokes. Mm -hmm. And for alien, they're all sitting there and they're making noise and they're making jokes mm -hmm. until the chest burster. Then the theater mm -hmm. just nobody said anything. Mm -hmm. And 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 isn't that an example of a scene that is effective purely? Be I mean, it's rooted in 
the conception of it, the idea mm -hmm. of a birth, of a man giving birth. And not only that, through his chest, which is the place where you breathe from. It's yeah. not even his stomach, it's his chest. So it so it goes after the whole idea of like an unnatural birth. This thing that doesn't look like a human comes out. Uh, it's it's and, and it's coming through the chest, not other parts of the body. And uh, I, I, there, there, I, it just it just it just blew people away. And remember, this was the first week of seeing it. Oh, the, the, the place was just like. You know, it was like everybody was like the characters on the on the on the screen. They're all just staring. Like, what, 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 what was that? Yeah. Well, when was the last time that you can say that you honestly saw a film where you're just like your jaw drops and your whole mm. perspective changes? I mean, mm -hmm. Alien is one of the few films where it delivers a monster, and when you fucking see that thing, it really is alien. Exactly. It delivers. Yeah. The fact that it even holds up still to this day. I mean, you know, well, it looks better the, than the CGI. It looks better than the CGI. Mm -hmm. You know, the um, Ripley on the uh, escape pod. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it took me viewing after viewing after viewing to finally be able to see, you know, the thing, you know, wrapped up in the uh, in the wall because it, yeah. it did such a great job of the design of the alien and everything right. that it's still when it moves, it still makes you jump. And yep. uh, her hand is right near it. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh my God, it's like right fucking there. Oh shit. You know, and I still get that that tense feeling, even though I know exactly what's gonna happen. You know, or um I'll see work prints of you know angles or shots that they never used where you see the alien, you know, the full bodied alien. And right. you know what? Those rarely ever like work prints aren't supposed to hold up, they're just right. the work print. Yeah. It still freaking holds up, mm -hmm. you know. And usually, when you see, once you get the big reveal, you know, all tension goes away. Oh, I know exactly what the thing looks like. It's like, no, it still makes me nervous seeing it standing right there. You know, because you really don't. You because every time you see it, up to the Harry Dean Stanton scene, it's different. It's so. In other words, you're going to see it later in parts, like. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody makes fun of, you know, when it gets Dallas, the jazz hands, but it's like, you know, it's Fred's at times, but it's like, okay, I, I get you. But at the same time, it, it's, it's, it's cut very, it's very tight. You have to you remember this is 40 years ago and things aren't going to be exactly as MTV <laughs> as they are today. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I remember this vividly because I still have the set of Autastic magazines and Starlog magazines. They, really, Scott um, has previewed it more than any other movie he's done because he kept cutting frames. He kept going every time they had a a, a, um, a showing. He went back to all the shots that are still that are in the movie right now, and he kept cutting. From the from the tail and the head of, of those shots because he wanted to get it as tight as possible so that through the whole movie every time it showed up you were like you're trying to see it you're trying to see more of it right and one of the things that disappointed me so much about covenant is that i remember this vividly he said in um cinefantastic i don't want to do any shots of like you know this guy in a suit running down a corridor because that gives the whole thing away. And in the climax of Covenant, you see the thing running down a corridor and going down the stair, the uh, ladder. It's, C mm. it's almost like, yeah, but it's CGI. It's not a suit. It's like, it, that doesn't matter. See, it's it's know, the concept. The suit looked better. Well, the yes. suit I did not look like a dude in a suit. Right. I was fully immersed in the idea of this is an alien. You know, it's probably because the the guy that they did get did you know did not have quote unquote normal proportions. He was right. really tall and super skinny, so yeah, yep. you, you didn't get this bulky alien suit going. The CG, it's like wow. So you grabbed the walk cycle <laughs> from the T Rex <laughs> from Jurassic Park and you threw that onto your your xenomorph. Okay. You know, I, I, something died in me at the climax of Covenant when that shot came up. I was like, no. 
and and already I'd been very disappointed. I mean, there were things I liked in Co- Co- Covenant, but I didn't I didn't like it. I did like Prometheus, which I have to defend to some people, but I but Covenant, I was just like, oh, you had a, you have Ridley Scott doing an alien movie, and this is the story you chose. <laughs> and it, you know it's just it's like damn it's like you it, it, there's so little to it and that person that they that um what's her face who did the the ripley stand in i'll be honest with you i wanted to see nomi rapace come back i thought she was terrific in prometheus the w- the one who played um shaw dr shaw oh and, you know and, what i have not i've not let those movies harm my brain i've never seen <laughs> Well, we could go out about that some other time. We, I, I, you probably did <laughs> you know, right after, you after probably did. Alien Four, I said, you know what? Screw you guys! I'm going uh, home. I'm not giving you money. <laughs> Alien Four, Alien Four, and I, I apologize. By the way, hello to all of your uh, listeners. I forgot to say hello. Um, Alien Four is this. <laughs> This is another one. This is the only. This is the only time this has ever happened to me in the movies. I sat down, paid my ticket, sat down with my friends, are watching the first shot in the movie. In my head, I went, no, it's wrong. And it took me a while to figure it out. They had this fantastic um, director of photography, Darius Kanji, who did Mm -hmm. Seven. And you can see everything in the movie. There is no, um, they don't play with the focus at all. It's, it's, and in a horror movie, you're supposed to have, darkness in the corners you're supposed to it, it was like the most brightly lit horror movie i've ever seen and it's just like uh, the characters were terrible everything was everything was terrible the whole movie is terrible but um yes. mm-hmm. it, it's just it it's it everything did everything wrong it's like that's what you would have gotten if someone if they got a hollywood um hack director to do an alien movie and you know i know that the director is french and he's whatever but it was <laughs> uh, Oh, oh. Don't um, get me started. I, lost children, damn it! He can do it. That's a great. Well, that's a see, see, which still I, has I one of the awesome him. opening I scenes. Him, honestly, I I blame some Barney Weaver because mm-hmm. I watched the uh, the making of um, mm-hmm. little thing that that the Sci Fi Channel ran yep. when it was coming out, and it was all about Sigourney Weaver, and it was right. all about her and her vision, and you know what she was going through, and other stuff. It was like, no, I I blame her squarely and solely uh, because, yeah, that is that is yeah. She wanted to be you know, look at me, I'm forty whatever I am, and I'm. I'm I'm still buff, and then I hear you're, you're shooting like, basketballs. That, that, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. That's why I like the original Alien. That's this. That's what I liked about it. Is you know, it's. I almost wish that uh, they did. They didn't make Aliens as a direct sequel to the first one. But you know, I liked it. But uh, it, it's just not in the. It's just not in the uh, um, same. Ballpark. Aliens is one of those films where as long as you don't think about it, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a good movie. Long good as movie. you don't think, yeah, you start because, asking questions and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, then it, the what, plot un, uh, unravels like a freaking sweater, right? Which which is why you know I I have my complaints about Prometheus, but it really annoyed me how the f- big James Cameron Aliens fans would dump it on the logic of that movie. I'm like, you might want to just hold your you know hold yeah. your fire on that. <laughs> In the like, first place, um, Ripley would never have gone back because no, she's no. because she's an intelligent person. Yeah. The sec- this and this is the other thing which is funny. Um this is something that that movie has always been praised for and I sat there the night I first saw it and I was like so wait a minute. And now remember again, this is you know, Catholic white boy from Boston, Massachusetts, Irish Catholic. You think of women in a certain way. Mm-hmm. After Alien, I, which I saw when I was in the 8th grade, right? I went and told my friends about it at school, and they ended up seeing everything. Guess what? Not once, not even once, did someone say, and the hero was a girl. <laughs> I mean, we're talking, I'm serious. I'll be mean, 13-year-old boys yeah. talking about it, and it was great in the end, and the things were blowing up, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I had never heard that, you know. Oh, and she's a girl. It's like, no, she was a person. You saw her and you saw her at the end. And you're like, when she's all alone, when she is, she sees Lambert and Parker. And then she goes that, that, uh, that sound and she runs. You're like, yes, run, run as fast as you can. Right. 
And it, one of the things that bugged me is that <clears throat> after she sets off the, um, the, the engines to explode, that's where they had the cocoon scene, you know, the, yeah. the scene they pulled out and, and, that was in and out of various previews. And finally they said, well, we're going for the action at that point. And I thought, it, it, I mean, the logic of taking it out of that section was perfect because, okay, you're setting the machines to blow up. You got to run, right? Yeah. But you could have done it very easily that she finds that either before or after she finds Parker and Lambert. You understand what I'm saying? Like before yeah. she even sets the machine, the the engine to blow, explode. Well, that would be a good reason to set it to blow, right? Because that would be the final straw. And he's just he he said I had it in, I had it out, but at the end of the day, um, it was like one shock too many, and you could feel people like disconnecting from the movie in the theater. And I got to trust him because I think otherwise the, the thing is perfect. So, but that scene is really good. And it and it and it actually adds that extra layer to the movie, which is, what the hell is this thing doing? Is it just killing people for fun? It's like no, and you see that whole process, which gets thrown out the window with that giant dinosaur alien mother in Aliens, which everyone thinks is so great except for me. Well, I liked the idea that it was a self-contained life form, and that yeah. It, you know, you walk in, so there's that scene, she walks in, and they're all cocooned on the walls. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the scene I'm talking about. That yeah, they... that, that should have stayed. Yeah, I, I, particularly, again, because once you see that, this little thing in your mind goes, I get it. It's going to lay you know, eggs it, now. Right, and and like the, the, the alien, as far as the, excuse me, um, it just says this whole life cycle going on. And I, I just, I just think it, it hits that. Sh there's a shot right there, the derelict. I just think it, th this is that's a movie like very few other movies where all the elements fell into place, and you can't plan all of that. You've gotta, you gotta just do the very best you can do. And one of the things, by the way, <clears throat> is um, you know, the Necronomicon painting that you know really Scott pointed to and said, "That's it. That's the yeah. one." Mm -hmm. It has eyes in that. And and he, I think it was he who said, "We it's not going to have eyes because if you look at the um, Giger with the sculpting, he uses. I remember a, the um, concept art, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and and he uses a human skull for the thing, and so it's you can see that even at that point he was still thinking in terms of eyes, but the not having eyes is the thing that makes it so alien, indeed, because it, it's like I, I, it's like when you see it in the movie." your brain just keeps it's like i have so many questions i don't know what i'm dealing with and you're dead by that point mm -hmm. I can't, look what you did this see this is what happens every someone to bring that's this okay. damn movie up <laughs> okay well, that's good I, I will say this okay i do you think we'll get my, busted if we share this uh maybe okay um, all right then you can then just just tell me that my, my, no we were uh, watching the cocoon scene yeah oh okay i have to say my um experience with alien is not yours because you know mm -hmm. I, I wasn't born when the first one came out and mm -hmm. with the subsequent ones i was way too young yeah. um so yeah. yes i did see them in order mm -hmm. but um i saw my mom had an you know an old 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 vhs taped off of on tv um mm -hmm. bootleg of the first film so when i was finally old enough that she'd let me watch it i watched that didn't see it ag again for like you know nearly a decade and then um my friend in high school really wanted to show me um aliens so i saw the first film and the internet was young and somebody had put up some of the Cut scene. So I saw the cocoon scene on on uh, you know the wild west of uh, young internet in like ninety nine two thousand, and then I I watched the director's cut of Aliens. So mm -hmm. that is my experience. So in my mind, knowing biology, 
I chalked up the xenomorphs as being one of those creatures where they can either produce asexually or mm -hmm. they can, you know, if there's enough of them, they can do the hive thing and create a queen. And that's how I always pictured right. what was going on, or at least that's how I yeah. justified why you had an alien queen, especially because Giger designed it. No, no Giger didn't design no, it. No, James Cameron did. James Cameron did yeah. design it. Giger signed off on it and said, yeah, that looked pretty awesome. Um, and I thought that it 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 worked given the confines of the universe with yeah. the movies at that time. Um, I couldn't get through the third one, I'm going to be honest. And uh, <laughs> when the when the fourth one came out and I saw the that documentary that uh, or that that making of thing the Sci Fi Channel did, I said this looks stupid and just <laughs> bypassed it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, you're talking to one of the only people on this planet who likes Alien 3 more than Aliens. So Now, now here's the other thing. Do you mean the original version or do you mean the the I, the, 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 the the director's cut? Because I have yeah. no interest in the original version. The director's cut, I'm actually very interested in. I haven't seen it well, yet, but I, I'm well, the, interested. Well, the director's cut, which, he, you know, <laughs> Fincher insists that everybody call it the, uh, the um, assembly uh, cut, which is, you know, just putting, cause he didn't do that. Um, that one, he kind of, they used his final cut before mm -hmm. they, you know, cut 40 minutes out. They, they like st stuck to it as closely as they knew how to. And they even did a couple of special effects and, um, they redid some of the sound. So it all, all the, you know, found stuff fit perfectly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the original theatrical cut. I like, I do like it because considering what it is, I think it works. It's kind of like the David Lynch Dune. It's like you were never going to get a great movie out of that. <laughs> and I love David Lynch. He's my favorite director. Um, but I, Alien 3, I always liked it. And for 10 years, that was the only version you could see. But the assembly edit is like, it, it's, it's like the difference between a trailer and a feature film. It just expands so much. And it still doesn't fix the most fatal flaw in the movie, which is you can't tell who any of the supporting cast are. <laughs> and as they die on screen, you go, oh, I thought he died 20 minutes ago. It, it just you if you you just you're just doomed if, you, if you're that way with a movie. And um, I, but having said that, I, I love it. I really do. I think there's so much in the assembly cut that is fantastic you should see it i strongly recommend it so moving on yes. to uh, other films why yes. are you one of those terrible people who doesn't like the thing <laughs> john carpenter's thing yeah um no 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 ben graham well <laughs> <laughs> he was my favorite superhero um because he's so hard i, I, I could what kind, of, what, kind of a, what kind of show do people have me on? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, go ahead. Go, go, sorry, that, go was, ahead. That, that would that's that's like a uh, that's a show in itself. Uh, how much Why do you we don't have like that much thing? time? But I that's not I let's put it I'll okay. I appreciate what everyone says about it, but I have always I have watched it three times, okay? So no one can tell me I wasn't open to it. Um I just think um, the characters are all zeros. I just have no connection to them. Well, the characters an alien were no, no, that's not true. Um, I, I care about none of these people, and I think the effects are amazing, and it's a great show of special effects. A, a, at no point am I like in the movie, the whole movie, and I've seen again, like I said, I've seen it three, maybe four times. Because I'm like, all the people who like Alien tell me I should like this. I, I just, I just thought it was, yeah, it, it was a special effects reel, and it had good things in it. Um, and you and I have talked about the music, and I, I do, I, the, it, and the final nail in the coffin was that John Carpenter tweeted a couple of years ago. Yeah, interesting fact about the thing. I first offered it to Jerry Goldsmith, but he couldn't fit it into his schedule. Jerry Goldsmith was writing the score to Poltergeist at the time. And <clears throat> that's who John Carpenter went to to say, can you do the score? And he says, I can't do it. I, I, I just don't have the time. 
that you know what i have a feeling that if jerry goldsmith wrote the score I, suddenly i would my eyes would be open to all the wonder of it because i'm such a jerry goldsmith slob. well it's kind of weird the <laughs> soundtrack is one of the parts of the thing that i really like that yeah, is also too. a bit confused because mm -hmm. he got ennio marconi to do the soundtrack mm -hmm. and then what he got he didn't use most of <laughs> yeah because it was unusable <laughs> Well, I, I have the original uh, Verez album that came out when the movie came out. Mm -hmm. And then I got the CD of that. And I, I, I liked it. I mean, I like, because I, well, I have, I have over 100 Ennio Marconi albums. That's why I liked it. But I, I, like you just said, I was like, I don't seem to remember much of this being in the movie. No, none of it really fit the film. Almost all of it's Carpenter's music. Mm -hmm. Well, have you heard the Marconi music? Yeah, I have. I, I like it. I think it I think it could have it could have added a lay a layer to the film. And I think it was strange that he you know, you're gonna go to that amount of trouble because it was kind of complicated because Marconi doesn't understand English. So he had to go through and he wrote um the music that he wrote the first time through and recorded it um without not to the not to uh, to he didn't do it to picture. It they're all just cues you know do you understand what i'm saying they just yeah. mm -hmm. it's straight music and it's like and then i guess then carpenter sent him the edited film and he worked with that i'm not quite sure at that part and then is you know there's also another cd i have which is a, like an anniversary cd and what it is is alan howarth who did um who works on you know carpenter's scores with him and he performed on synthesizers the entire Marconi score and all the music that he and John Carpenter did so this is the first time to really have all the music in one place wait where do, where do I get this you can get it I think I'm pretty sure you can get it on Amazon okay. um, just look up uh, Alan Howarth H-O-W-A-R-T-H okay. and um, the, in the liner notes they talk about that and when you get this you'll listen to it it's like oh I recognize that piece oh I recognize that piece from the movie yeah, the, the marconi score really sounded like it would fit more like a gothic haunted house film mm -hmm. is what i recall the original cuts yeah i, I agree the uh, the carpenter score really fit the desolation and the minimalism of this of the film in my mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. i i th i like when marconi does science fiction or horror and he leans in that direction as opposed to have you ever heard of some of the some of the Italian science fiction movies he does? It's almost like, you know, it, it's like it's like it's something from the '60s. It's like it's so, and I don't mean the good '60s. I mean kind of like you know the goofy '60s. <clears throat> and and some of those scores really puzzled me because I, I I just buy a Marconi album it, that comes in front of me, I pick it up and buy it. Okay, so I haven't seen most of these movies. And uh, you know Sergio Leone, the director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They John Zorn. Who is a do you know who John Zorn is? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, he did a Marconi album and he included in the liner notes I've seen they talked to he talked to uh Leone about the Marconi music and he said, What's it like scoring a movie with Marconi? And he says, It's an unnerving experience. I said, What do you mean? And Leone says, He laughs at everything. He laughs <laughs> at the jokes, he laughs at the deaths, he laughs at the violence. And he says, and he and like he just gives you this picture of him sitting there, like in the theater with Marconi, and he's just kind of like looking at him, like, is this guy gonna jump on me and rip my head off or something? And Marconi's just laughing at every at everything from beginning to end. And I thought that's perfect. You know, it is, it's just it, it's unnerving. That's the way he described it. Okay, so Marconi, wow. we've got the 12 handed men from Mars that he did. <laughs> the 12 handed, I don't know what that is. Let's see. Uh, here, I'll. It's not. It's. I was in the sixties. Oh. oh, for God's sake! The, 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 we could do an eight-hour show on Marconi. His whole. Well, you said whole... Uh, some of the sci-fi, so I'm looking. Oh yeah, no, I'm, no, no. I'm. T I'm. What I'm saying is, <laughs> it's also hard. Ed, as any of anyone who knows more about Italian cinema than I, I do, can tell you, it's hard to discern what's what, because. Oh, the big gun down. What an incredible score. The big gun down is what is right up there with the good, the bad, the ugly, and a few dollars more. 
it's an incredible score. Uh, oh, oh my god. Um, oh, it's got, it's got Lee Van Cleef. Okay, I, yeah. that already means I have to see it now. Yeah, it's got oh. Lee Van Cleef in it. Fantastic flick. It, oh, Lee Van Cleef is awesome in it, but you didn't need me to tell you that. Well, it, basically, Lee... Lee Van Cleef is one of those actors where I don't care what it is. If it's him, I'll go check yeah. it out. Well, <laughs> Kat, you've been looking for Westerns. Yeah. Now you've got one to mm -hmm. order. Um, and, you know, who's like that with me? He's like that with me. And uh, oh, have you seen, um, what's the trilogy? He only did the first, the third one of um, Sabata. Do you know those? The Lee no. Van Cleef movies? He, he, he wasn't able to do the second one, so Yul Brenner plays his part in the second one. And then he comes back for the third one. It's uh, Sabata, S-A-B-A-T-A. -A -A. Check those out. That works, though, with uh, Yul Brenner. Oh, I, I like don't it. know. It's, it's They're good very, very I, different. They're absolutely, different. Oh, absolutely. But but I think it works. Yeah, it's like you, you just, in to my head. It's just like okay, this this isn't the same character. That's all. And yeah, it goes. It's fine. Well, it, it, it's it's not the character. It's the type. Yes, and that's why I say it works. So, I mean, he proved that in uh, uh, Westworld, where yeah. he's basically playing his character from this the Magnificent Seven. Okay, no so uh, he did Danger Diabolique. Ennio Marconi. That's that's oh, yeah. one of those wacko. 60s scores of his but movies wacko i mean you know it <laughs> has a it, it has what i swear was the uh the, the predecessor to the adam adam west era batman bat cave i never thought of that but you're absolutely right with that that thing in the background which is where the bat cave is that nuclear thing mm -hmm. it's, it's it's in the cave and that girl is uh, that's what you mean when you talk about like you know a, a blonde that's yeah. that, I I know her her name is falling in front of me, but oh my! I mean that movie. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now, but when I think of it, I'll write down a few more uh, Lee Van Cleef's if you want for you for uh, westerns if you're looking for them. But cool, the yeah. Big Gun Down's a fantastic. It's a good, really good movie. It isn't just oh, you're one of his. And Danger Diabolic is di by um, Mario Bava, who mm -hmm. did uh, Black Sunday and uh, Black Sabbath, and uh, I have. The um, Lisa and the Devil, which I haven't seen in years. Lisa and the Devil is a movie he made in the 70s, right around the time of The Exorcist. And the producer took the movie away from him and filmed a new scene. There she is. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> Maria Mel. That's her name. No, M Marcia Mel, something like that. Um, they took the movie away from Bava. He added characters. He had Timothy Hutton's father, I think, played a priest who goes and gives somebody an exorcism. Now, there was none of that in the original movie. So how do you add a whole subplot about exorcism because the movie The Exorcist was just a, a, a big hit? It, it, the two versions of the movie are like, it, it, you feel like, oh, I've slipped into an alternate universe because they literally like tries to, you know, somehow bash this whole exorcism subplot into a movie that has nothing to do with exorcism. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay, oh we'll bring God. up another film that I like that you don't, that is in the vein of space horror. Okay. You also don't like Event Horizon. Oh, you don't? No. Oh, I think it's okay. one of the stupidest damn movies I've ever seen. <laughs> really? How come? Um, I'll do, let's I'll just give you one example. Remember the whole beginning where they're in the ship and they're they're heading towards the event horizon, right? Yeah. You know mm -hmm. there. Um, and what's her name? Uh, is the uh, pilot? Uh, she's uh, Vanessa Redgrave's daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's like, you know, uh, fifty, you know, forty, thirty, and she's, you know, because they're going through fog, right? And then she suddenly pushes herself back from the from the console because she's looking at the window and she goes, God, she says, God, you know what she's yelling God about the ship that she has been trying to dock with. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, she's counting down to when she's going to dock. And then when the fog clears and she sees it, uh, she pushes back. Actually, she wasn't counting down to uh, their docking. It, she was counting down to proximity. And they couldn't see it. Oh, well, uh, okay. Oh, well, no, okay. But 
and you know what I'm saying. The ship to uh, find a place to. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they, and they dock yeah. at, at gate 13. Gee. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah I, that, I that's just, not uh, on the nose there. <laughs> I kind of got the impression it was more the image of the ship that got her. It, it might have been, of... but is that really how you want your pilot to act? No, what, what happened was <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And okay. I'm actually going to chalk it up to a mistiming of the editing because she does that and she kind of pushes away. And it's mm -hmm. supposed to be a shock to see suddenly that that um, fog part and the ship sure. is just there. And right. it's the shock of it. But they take their sweet ass time. It's a full 10 seconds before you get the, the mist parting and you get the ship. So it, that it, that that shock, that that jolt is lost. It, it's and, what it what it I'll put it this way. What got me about that was that's the response you and I are supposed to have to it. That's not the response they're supposed to have to it in the movies. Like the first shot of Star Wars when the big ship comes over your head, the people on the Rebel cruise run going, "Oh my God, look at how big that thing is!" They're going, "Holy shit!" The, uh, if you want to do Event Horizon sometime, we'll get to. Oh, well, what else? <laughs> no, I mean, it, 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 it's interesting because because again, you know film and you know filmmaking. No, see, this is one of the and, few films that actually creeps me out. And same here, actually. I've heard that so. from actually from a lot of people, sure. I mean, like The Exorcist, I actually found funny. I mean, I know I'm a same. terrible person. Same, I laugh at it. I, I, I know that that's not the reaction you're supposed to have, but I actually kind of found it funny. But that's, the, um, but that's see, that's an honest reaction, so that's what people should want, and the people who made The Exorcist should be like, well, I guess it didn't age as well. Um, oh, it, no, it's just... Uh, uh, you need you need to embrace uh, the. You have to have at least some sort of Catholic mindset or an acceptance of demons. And there's there's one other thing that I have to mention about that, which is you had to have been there because I was only in like second or third grade. That was all anyone in the entire world was talking about for about a month. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single day the news had a different story on it. Now, which is why it's funny to me, like, you know, a movie comes out now and like a week later, it's like, you know, most of the people saw it opening week that want it. And, you know, it's made $10 zillion. And now it's already sat. Now we're not even talking about it anymore. We're on to the next thing. And you, this is one of those few cases where I say y you really had to be there because, I mean, I personally knew friends whose adult brothers and sisters were going to priests, were going to psychiatrists, were staying, were sleeping with the lights on. Yeah. And it's really a situation where you had to understand like what people thought of as a movie and what a horror movie was, which uh, the other thing, Pauline Kael mentions that about Psycho. She says the, the shower scene, it breaks so many, so many taboos. And one of them was bait was really, you're not supposed to really be scared by something in a movie. You're supposed to like, jump and then giggle at how you were scared by Vincent Price or whatever. But that was like, she said that was like an assault. And I agree with that. I, I well, think the, sh the, the showers in Psycho is still amazing. The other thing about that is um, you fully 100% expect Janet Leigh to be, you know, St to carry you through the film. So yep. not only is the shower scene shocking, not only is it cut in such a way to be jarring, you know, by the end, you're like, wait, she's dead? Wait, what yep. just happened? <laughs> mm -hmm. And and the thing is, too, is that, you know, that's the only Oscar Psycho got nominated for was supporting actress. Mm -hmm. And I think that as an element of it, I mean, I think it's like, she they did a really good job of making you like that character and want to be and you were interested in what happened mm -hmm. so it's almost like someone came in and threw the reels of the film out the window it's like but i thought i was going to watch her you know having to somehow build her life back again or you know sneak the money back or something like that and suddenly it's like mm, that's not that's over we're under something else now <laughs> you know um and the, the and this this the, and my favorite the psycho story, of course, is that Hitchcock originally didn't want to have any music in the uh, shower scene, and mm -hmm. and Bernard Herman says, "I think I can do something with that." And he said, uh, "You can do what you want, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to use it." And he was there when they recorded it, and he says, "Okay, we're going to use that." <laughs> it was like very <laughs> low key, 
Ed, his wife, you know, Hitchcock's wife, um, Revel, um, her last name was Revel, uh, felt, what was it, what was Hitchcock's wife's, wife's name? Um, I don't know. I, Alma, 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 Re she was an editor in back in England and she basically was Hitchcock's like, you know, co-writer on all of his movies. So it, Robert Block, who, you know, he heard this story, he said, um, so when he showed it to her, the finished movie, he was like, that's who made him nervous. The studio didn't make him nervous. The fans didn't make him nervous. They saw the whole movie and his wife turns to him in front of all these people who, you know, the, the people who worked on the movie. And she says, you can't release it this way. And like, everyone was like, what, what did we miss? Like, what did we miss? And she says to Hitchcock, when Janet Lee falls out of the shower, you can see her blink. And it was in one frame. And she's the only person who caught it. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but that, I mean, that's how, that's how she's like, she saw that. Because like I said, she was an editor for years. That's how they met. Wow. <laughs> now, I'm still thinking about the phenomena of the exorcist of just mm -hmm. how many people did mm -hmm. have a, a diagnosis after after that film mm -hmm. of uh you know they had been uh would experience panic attacks actually I, I found people still do it i mean again you know i i guess it comes from how you how you were raised how you grew up yeah. um but i've had um people who were you know 10 20 years younger than me um say they saw the exorcist for the first time and they're like that is the scariest shit i have ever seen and it's like okay well you know good well, for you that you have had that experience watching a movie that scared the you know fucking yeah. pants off of you you know oh, sure. that is not one movie for me but that is good that it is for you so well, it's funny because you know on paper that's like my kind of movie and um i i mean i, I i've always liked it i i love the opening in iraq i love that sequence um and it, i think it's a good movie I like it, but it's like it's never been like one of my big, huge, you know, favorites as someone who's into horror movies and horror writing. I um, I think uh, the acting is really good. And I think it's. Uh, um, oh, there's nothing oh. to knock on the film. I yeah. mean, the film yeah. is a good film. Um, I, the conceit is you have to buy into the uh, Catholic conception of demons. If you don't. Yeah, it doesn't function. Yeah, I think yeah, I think Exorcist three is the best of the whole series. Frankly, I've never seen the other two. I, I've seen well, the second skip, one. Oh uh, wait, wait, wait! You did see? We saw reviews of the second one. God, it was yeah. retarded. It, it's as horrible. I, I actually, one night I watched the whole thing. You were asleep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> Directed by John Borman, who did uh, Excalibur. Excalibur, yeah. um, a good movie and, he directed. Yes. The, uh, yeah, and he directed another movie. It just so happens it's the next movie I have in my stack, but it's already at the top of the hour, which is Point Blank. Have you ever heard of that movie? Point Blank? I've yes. heard of, have not seen. Uh, it stars <clears throat> Lee Marvin as a uh, criminal. He's a, th he's a thief. Mm -hmm. And the movie opens with his wife and his best friend betraying him, and they shoot him. And then leave him for dead on Alcatraz. And the whole rest of the movie is he wants his money that is owed him. That's the whole rest of the movie. And um, you must see it. Everyone who can hear my voice, you must see this movie. Uh, we're actually... Uh... Well, you know, leave Marvin alone to reason to see it. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. He's fantastic. You know, if they and, had made a Judge Dredd in like the 80s, oh, I would have picked Lee Marvin. Yes. Holy cow, that's a great casting choice. I never thought of that. He, he would have been what, absolutely perfect. Because you know what else he, he has, been good for? Oh, and Keenan wins in this too. Oh, yeah. What else, Carol, Marvin? Carol O'Connor is in it. Yeah. Archie Bunka is in it. And um, uh, Dean Wormer is in it from Animal House. And Angie Dickinson. I will nice. say no more. Yeah, oh, you got to see it. It's it's very. It was intentionally like made to be very, um, like pop art. Like you know that was in, that was in in the eighties. You know the jumping around and oh, it's it's fantastic. It's a fantastic movie. You must see it. What happened to you? You just you distract me with alien. 
Right? Yes. All these movies I want to recommend <laughs> to people. But uh, I yes. was going to say the other thing Lee Marvin would have been great for in the 80s is I Am Legend. Yes. Because that he was the Absolutely. character described in that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, I mean, you see him in that and just thinking of it right now as we're talking here. Oh, I can see him getting up and like relentlessly like staking these creatures and like keeping that mask of like he's seen it all. Oh, he yeah. He literally has seen it all. I mean, and, Will Smith, uh, no. 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 I thought Will Smith was okay. And why didn't he move to New York? Be, well, you know, uh, yeah. I think Richard Matheson asked that of every version they did. Um, but as soon as the the, huh. the woman and the kid show up, I just like yeah. checked out. No, in Omega no. Man, it's uh, L.A. Well, actually, what yeah. was weird about Omega Man was it's my old neighborhood. Well, oh, that's, wow. from the book, it was your old neighborhood. Yeah, in the book, it's my old neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. It, when Inglewood was in a slum. And so, you know, he's describing places. I know exactly where that is. My grandparents live like half a mile from there. But so. you know, the difference is New York, you know, you've got the boroughs and that the, it's on an island. Yeah. So it's kind of a closed environment where when L.A. is just this vast asphalt you know, wasteland yeah. right. that just goes on and on and on. And yeah, in the movie Omega Man, God, that was beautifully shot because... Mm -hmm. You know, you get these by, uh, scenes of just, you know, these vast expanses of abandoned Los Angeles. And I know they were doing it at like 5 a.m. right when the yeah. sun came up. So there was Look at that shot. Look road. at that shot right there in the trailer. Yeah. yeah but, yeah, just, you know, absolutely it looks, beautifully shot. Mm -hmm. Looks abandoned. You know what's sad is it looks better than current L.A. Yeah, it does look better than current L.A. <laughs> and Roseanne Cash was great in it, too. Mm -hmm. Um Directed by uh, Boris Segal. Did I tell you the Bor the great Boris Segal story? No, no. Well, in the first place, his he's um his daughter is Katie Segal, the actress. Oh, oh, okay. from uh, Married with Children. Yes, and in 1979, Boris Segal he he uh, he made very few theatrical movies. He was big in television television movies, and he was making a movie called World War Three. You familiar with that miniseries? It was basically no. two parts. It was about the Russians are uh, secretly, um, they send it, uh, like an attack force into a pipeline in Alaska. And the small group of American soldiers like meet them there. And so the whole thing is like, is this thing going to escalate to, you know, the end of the world, right? <clears throat> well, Boris Segal had a reputation for being um, very angry when he didn't get his way on things which as you can imagine in filming that happens mm -hmm. so they filmed a scene with the helicopter and you know in the ice and come down he he went to the helicopter pilot and he would just chewed him out he was like you know you screwed up you're screwing this up screwing up, knock it off and he turned and walked right into the rear rotor oh, and his shit. head and his head came off oh god because he was I so worked up you, get complete when, when, when uh, it was, it would, it, it was, they've just went on with, you know, somebody else and directed the rest. But, um, and that's what happened. It was like he just worked himself. That's how this guy had a temper. And he was just chewing this guy out and then, like, you know, walked away with a big dramatic exit and he lost his head. Oh, geez. That, that is, um, that's a way to go. That's yeah. a way to go. <laughs> yeah. He, he, um, yeah. <laughs> I know there are a lot of actors that kind of and crew that kind of wish that had happened to James Cameron. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've I've heard so many negative things about him, and uh, you know, I, I think he's technically amazing, but I put yeah. him like with Steven Spielberg, which is what, like, what is it? Don't be a Brit and work with James Cameron, and don't work in water and with James Cameron. <laughs> well, they have the T-shirt. You you don't scare me. I work for James Cameron. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a T-shirt they had, but um, like he and Spielberg, like I, I mean, I could sit here all night telling you, uh, you know, they this the masters of the technique. And I think both of them have absolutely nothing to say. And you don't have to have much to say to make an interesting movie. Oh, yeah. Just a little something, right? But, um, yeah, Russell Meddy shot The Omega Man. He also shot a movie called Touch of Evil that was directed by Orson Welles. Which yeah, is I've seen Touch of Evil. It's the same guy who shot The Omega Man. 
Oh, and, okay. Yeah, and the music was the music to Omega Man is really good. I really like. Yes, that. yeah, yes, it, it is. The, the guy who did uh, the Doctor Who theme wrote that. Really, I didn't Ron, know Ron that. Greener. Ron oh, Greener. Wow. Yeah. It kind of has a prog rock sound to the uh, the soundtrack for Omega Man. Yeah, because it's got that. Um, it, you know, that seventies. That's the way they were scoring things before. Yeah. You know, Jaws and Star Wars. And usually, I just dismiss those, but it's a really good theme, and it just gets that. Right from the first frame, it's gets you know it gets that downbeat sound, and mm -hmm. you know most most movies at that time they shy away from negativity like that. You know they at least give you like I mean listen to some of uh, Quincy Jones uh, scores from the time, and they're really good, but they're like happy even for like crime movies. Even though the seventies was like an era of really depressing films, <laughs> yeah. And uh, they, they, you got to give us something uh, before, because I know we're running long. But I wanted there's one movie I thought of that I wanted to mention. Oh sure, is, go ahead. Have you ever heard of a Irish uh, horror flick? I'm looking for the uh, year. Um, uh, why, why am I not seeing the year? Um, I'm going to say around 2010. It's called Isolation. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, no. That's World War Three. Yeah, that's the movie. That's the one. Um, Isolation is about um, a... Uh, 2005? David Lynch? Or John Lynch? Yes, that is it. Yeah, wait, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Sorry. Um Okay. Um, yes, that's uh, it. That's it. Billy that's the one. Billy O'Brien. That is it. O'Brien. O'Brien. Yeah. Okay. Um, Not Neil Brain. No, <laughs> I said O'Brien. There, <clears throat> it's about a small group of people uh, stuck on a farm. <clears throat> excuse me. Where the livestock has been treated with some experimental stuff, and I'll just leave it there, because I this is one of those ones I walked into without knowing anything about it, and. You know, if you liked the thing, I bet you'd like it. It has nothing. Ooh. the The threat has nothing to do with the thing. You know, yeah. alien. But it's but what it is is it it really works you over in a small place. Well, the big part of the thing is not the creature, even though the creature is pretty awesome. It's mm -hmm. um, it's the paranoia that right. its presence creates. So. Right, and that's and th this movie does a does a very good job of that like i i like movies that can show you like these pressure cooker situations that bring something you know something else out of it mm -hmm. and this comes at you at different angles like you you don't know who to trust also again like in the thing there's something else to deal with besides just the people around you and i think this it, it just did a very good job and again <clears throat> i saw it without knowing anything about it and it's really good so check that out look if somebody can make cows scary that's pretty good mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah this would this would be a good co-feature with uh contagion uh contagion you saw that I, I have not seen mm -hmm. oh that you should see that it's it's pretty grim as you can imagine but it was pretty good but um Anyway, have you guys seen anything good lately? Um, lately. Lately. <laughs> lately. Yeah. Uh, that's, the, that's the key. Um, um, uh. <laughs> well, someday we'll, well, someday we'll talk about Legend and uh, uh, yes. Matango. And Matango. Yeah. And, well, you know. Let, you know. <laughs> I, I need to watch Legend again. So uh, yeah. so that so we'll have to oh. set that up. Uh, but yep. Matango, I could talk about, you know, just off the top of my head. So. You know, uh. Sadly, we're in an era <laughs> where um, we're in an artistic low point in the United States. I mean, there are good sure. indie films being made, but finding them is the problem. That's it. Wolf Cop. Well, yeah, Wolf Cop was fun. <laughs> Wolf Cop. I've wolf never heard cop. of that one. <laughs> wolf cop. Talk about Wolf Cop. Wolf Cop. Um, yeah, he's a cop, and then he gets bit and becomes a werewolf, and you go from there. And it sounds like it's going to be stupid. Well, it kind of is. It, it, a, it is, but it's have, not as stupid as you think it's going to well, be. Well, it's stupid in a good way. 
I, I completely, my wires crossed when you said that, and I thought, I was stuck. I was thinking, so it's about a wolf that got bit by a cop? <laughs> for, like five, for five seconds, that's what I thought, that's what I thought you actually said. I was like, what? No, no, but the, you know, the thing with Wolf Cop is they play it 100% serious the entire way yeah. through, and mm -hmm. That is why it's good. If at any point they mm -hmm. like turned to the camera and started, laughed. Yeah, yeah, if they started hamming it up, it wouldn't work. No, the fact that it is 100% serious the entire way through is what makes it truly amazing. So. Oh, boy. That sounds good now. See, I I am very um, extremely picky when it comes to horror and comedy. Um, yeah, I think because it when it's done right, it's incredible, and when it's done wrong, it just strikes me as being very lazy. It's like mm -hmm. you know that you aren't capable of really making the scary stuff, so you throw jokes in and say, "See, haha, we thought of that before you did. We we made fun of ourselves, and that doesn't that doesn't do anything for me." Well, like there's a film. Um, it was originally made in France, and then it was remade twice here in the United States. Um, I forget what really? it's called in in front uh, in the French version, but here in the United States, one is the editor, and the other is um, it, it's something Ed. And oh, uh, was it Evil Ed? Was it Evil Ed? Okay. Yeah. And the whole point is that you have um, a film editor who edits. Um, artistic films or nice I films. I saw a trailer for that. And yeah. then he's forced to edit, um, you know, the, just the goriest slasher films out, out there oh, and right. it warps his brain. And the the French version and the, the film, the editor... Uh, I think that was actually a finished production. Was it a finished version? Okay, the finished version and then the editor here... Uh, which was directed by Adam Brooks and Matthew. It's the same team that did uh, Psycho Gorman and. Uh, and oh, and, Psycho uh, Gorman was uh, good. Psycho Gorman like and uh, Manborg. And Void. And Void, yes. So they did it beautifully. It's a great film, highly recommend it. Well, in um, that one, it's not that he's editing um, slashers, he's editing Jalo films. Yeah, he's editing Jalo films. The great thing in that one, as as he starts to go crazy, mm -hmm. he begins to realize he's in a Jalo film. Yes. And the plot starts making less and less sense. And the part where you see where he finally crosses over into full crazy is he's shaving and he's looking in the mirror and a cigarette burn pops up in the corner for a second. Yes. And he sees it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and well, uh, so yeah, that was suddenly... the editor. Yeah, that's the editor, and so highly recommend that one. Um, and that's we should actually add it to our collection because it's that good. Yeah, it's uh, by the guy related and, to, and it's got Udo Kier in it. Everything with Udo Kier is better. Oh wow, oh, Jesus! There's you have to. You, what is what is it? What's the line? He with that? What is what's his great line? You have to fuck reality in the gallbladder. That's yes. that's his, a line of his from. Um, is it? Um, the Dracula or the Frankenstein, Frankenstein, the um, Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. You have to fuck reality in the gallbladder. <laughs> Dude, I haven't seen that. Did, the, when, when you talked about the editor, did you ever see Barbarian Sound Studio? No. Um, oh, God. It's, uh, what, what the hell is the guy's name who's in it? Um, uh, Toby Jones. Do you know him? Nope. Mm -mm. He's a he's a little guy. If you if you punch him up, you'll know it. it's. Um, he is a guy editing sound in a 1970s Italian um, film oh, studio. This guy. He, he he's he, he's uh, editing a giallo film, and th I, th that's all I'll say about it. You should check it out if because everything you just said about the editor, it's like this sounds a lot like uh, Barbarian Sound Studio. The music is by Broadcast, and it's one of those it's one of those movies that the music is like it's in it's it's such a part of the movie because of you know the whole nature of the movie is about sound but um it, yeah it's another one I, it's odd and i really liked it and it's one of those things where you, your sense of reality starts to slip during it so 
uh yeah it's it's uh check that out well here's, here's one screen. other you're asking about films yeah. that we saw that were good here's an indie mm. film yes now this was Uncle from the Perry. early 2000s so it's set actually in the, the late 90s mm -hmm. um and i can say that the way that it portrays an indie band and the music industry of that mm -hmm. time oh, is cool. frighteningly accurate but the plot is very simple the band needs to go on tour they don't have a van and at the last minute they end up uh hooking up with this guy who calls himself uncle peckerhead because he has a van mm -hmm. who offers mm -hmm. to drive them around the country for the tour and it turns out he's a demon but a really nice one sold i'll check this one out definitely i'll yeah, check that, that one, one out. that was one of those things where we're just surfing around amazon saw the name uncle peckerhead it's like what the hell is this and decided to put it on figuring we were going to turn it off in five minutes and wound up watching the whole thing so yeah i think the thing is is films like this exist but yeah. how do you find oh, yeah. them they're not getting yeah. exposure no well, the, well, we're seeing the, you know, the uh, good news, bad news yeah. thing about, you know, the eruption of independent film. It's like there's tons of movies being made. The bad part is there's tons of movies being made. And you, it's, I mean, back in the day, like, you know, when I saw like Alien, mm -hmm. that, that, you, could, you could know all the movies coming out. Not, I'm not saying you would see them, but you would know what they were, that they were out there <clears throat> very easily. You could know that. Nowadays, I see people, I see shows that are like in their seventh season. And I'm like, I had never heard of this show before. It's been over seven years and I've, and I've, I've never heard of it before. Um, it, it, uh, out of left field, did you guys watch Millennium, the uh, TV series yeah. with? Uh, yeah. Someday we should talk about like the set, the, how like the, the second season is when, you know, Chris Carter had his back turned because he was making the X Files movie. Yeah. And that second season just went off and, and I thought it was an incredible season. And then when he came back, he, he, he killed, he kicked out the showrunners and tried to make it into just like, like the third season was like a cop show. It had like yeah. very little fantasy element to it. I saw that at the second season. Do you remember there was a, there's a whole uh, episode called somehow Satan got behind me where it's about these three demons who are having that's the one everyone remembers yeah the, and and um the guy who wrote that one uh i can't remember his name offhand but he like wrote like he wrote the um remember the funny episode in uh x files with um peter boyle is the guy who could predict when people die yeah yeah he, the same guy awesome. wrote those two those two episodes that and the demon one and um uh, the, I just thought that whole second season was fantastic, and then they sat the third season, and it's like we don't, we're not going that direction. No, we're, we're throwing that all away. Yeah, but anyhow. Well, um, okay. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, if you guys right. want to start recommending indie films, uh, yeah, I was going to mention you said that that used to be that you could see everything. Yeah, I don't know though because in the '90s there was the indie film boom. Now, granted, I mm -hmm. lived in the Bay Area and I could walk to any number of theaters and see all these indie films for like a buck. Oh sure, no, I, I. That's why I said I'm around the time of Alien. That was so yeah. uh, like that's. The, I mean, you, you, but there, what I mean is, is that you know, I don't know. Supposedly we have more access, but we're not really finding it, the content. You know what I mean? And I mean, I, I would I say do. let's turn to the indie press to find out. But unfortunately, it seems like everyone wants to just bitch about how much mainstream films suck. No one actually wants to cover what's good. Well, <clears throat> what, what, an, what, a, what a convenient uh, intro to something I mentioned you last week, which is that, you know, I'm putting together a um, YouTube channel that it's just I'm, and that's that's why I actually want to talk to you two. I want you to have, try to help me come up with a name for it because it's, you know, it, the gist of it is they're very, they're going to be short, like five or six minutes yeah. long, and they're all going to be recommendations. There's going to be no, you know, trashing of anything because we have enough of that. I want this to be like, if you, at some point, you can just like click over to that channel and all you're going to see on the channel is things I think you should see. Well, let me ask you, how the hell did we get to the point where the alternative press 
is just people bitching about the mainstream. Do you remember when alternative press, you know, you had film zines who just, it was all about loving film and mm -hmm. finding gems. You mm -hmm. had, uh, you know, these communities that were all about digging up the gems in music or film or you name it, or you know, books. And now basically film or art critique has all come down to, yeah, well, this movie from Disney sucks balls because, you know, again, the females run everything and the guys are cuck yeah. and, and the effects are really shitty and, and they want me to buy all this stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. What would you expect? It's a Disney film. Yeah, it, it, it all seems generated by the people who are um, doing these uh, criticisms as opposed to being generated by, I like this aspect of films. I want to talk about it. And because that's what, you know, film criticism used to be. It's like to make yeah. you aware of what this thing is like. Um, back in the 60s, you had uh, magazines like Castle of Frankenstein, which was a magazine Joe Dante wrote reviews for. And Joe Dante has to this day, he still is like, um, he doesn't like mystery science theater because he says, you know, you wanted to see this movie and they had these movies you've never seen. And then you finally find out it's going to be on. And these guys making cracks about it. And I'm of two minds of that, which is one, I agree. I get it. And at the same time, it's like, I got news for you, Joe. None of those movies would have gone anywhere if mystery science yeah. didn't mention them in the first place. A, 100% true. And B, do you know how many films I was exposed to because of mystery science theater Ex that are now here. on my shelf uncut without yeah. riffing? Is that, I yeah. mean, is that really is that really like such a, you know, intellectual leap, Joe, that you couldn't do that? Like, it, well, I mean, he's, he's they've like well, brought people who you never knew about. Well, it's into, because... It's because of Mystery Science Theater that the creators of Parts the Clonus Horror came, yes. you know, were put in front of new audiences, had new following, and um, the reason it's because of that fandom that uh, Michael Bay was called out for ripping mm -hmm. that film off blind. If right it down to the for, can and the water. Right yeah, down to the beer can in the water. Exactly. If it wasn't for Mystery Science Theater, the creators themselves would have been completely clueless to the fact that they had been ripped off. Mm -hmm. In the um, when I remember um, when Parts came out, I didn't see it, but what I remembered was it won an award as like best movie under like half a million dollars mm -hmm. at like one of these local um, film festivals. Like, I, I don't know if it was a in Los Angeles, like a fantastic film festival, something like that. But <clears throat> again, it, it's, it's Cinefantastic. If, um, if you guys have seen the physical magazine, Cinefantastic. Yeah. Okay. You know how at the, at the end they had like these charts, you know, that had, you know, like bullet points of like, you know, one to four bullets. And they literally like polled all of their writers. So you had a whole page and you could just literally see, I mean, you could see that these movies exist and, and they frequently, you know, wrote about them and, um, the, the, you know, you, they were very critical of a lot of them, but again, mm -hmm. they existed and it was part of a discussion and there were yeah. things they liked, but now it's like, you said it issue. You, you, you just said it perfectly. It's like, I'm, I can't wait till I can take on this multi-billion dollar corporation and tell them that their stuff stinks. And it's like, I don't get the charge, you know, and, and please, I, I love riff tracks. I, I, you know, I don't see it that much lately, but you know, but um, that's well, it's one thing to get a cheesy old film and, and right. spoof it. That's one thing. Uh, yeah. Midnight movies. That's kind of why they exist. Exactly. But it's another thing where somebody's entire channel content is getting the latest round of round of crap movies from Hollywood so they can sit there for 45 minutes and bitch about how awful it is. It's like, this isn't news to me. This isn't even entertaining. I mean, I can get the same effect uh, just by, you know, going to any uh, Starbucks or hearing some pretentious film student bitch about film. I, like, I thought of you yesterday and I said, I have to mention, remember to mention this to Ishii. So of course you just reminded me of the thing I was going to remind you of. Um, it's this guy who does the whole, you know, <clears throat> um, Hollywood is attacking conservatives and white males and all this shit. Yeah. And which uh, I have two things to say about that. One, I thought you guys are the ones who said that there was that there was that representation 
was meaningless bullshit. So why are you scared now that white men aren't being represented in tampon commercials? <laughs> um, but the other thing was, um, he said, he said like, Mar the MCU is dead. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy didn't make as much money as the last one. So and he's going off in this whole thing. And I was just looking at the stream going, what do you know about um, filmmaking, sir? Other than, you know, listening to commentary tracks on DVDs. I mean, what do you know about it? And what do you know about film financing? What do you know about how it's impossible for a movie like that to lose money because of all the ancill ancillary rights and all this other stuff? It's like, and they're all just telling this stuff to each other like they all know it. And th 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 it watching that gave me nothing. Watching that 10-minute piece I just told you about, it gave me nothing. And that is why this idea, this you know YouTube channel that I'm trying to think of a name for, listeners you can chime in anytime you want <laughs> um that's what i because I, because the thing is you think you know where is if you want to if you want to provide a service find a need and i find a need for that well here red letter media when they were critiquing the star wars films mm -hmm. meant something because mm -hmm. that was a cultural touchstone mm -hmm. and these were legit critiques that you yes. learned from and talked about what was wrong and what was right with these yep. movies. They, they taught filmmaking. Nowadays, you know, I, I could give a fuck what Red Letter Media thinks of the latest Marvel film. Yeah. I, I don't give a shit. Yeah, uh, I used to be like the, so into them, and now I'm like, uh, I, I've I've gone past that, which I think is a good thing. I don't think we do that anymore. We don't well, like say I can stop consuming this good thing. I'm not being critical. They're not of it, producing but... anything interesting. It's like no. okay, so we can hear Rich laugh at the movie stupid. Okay, well, great. And and um, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um, Mike makes me laugh. I think he's funny, and it's funny because when you look, I just wish they'd use their talent. When you look at what they do, I mean, because you know that's what they do, right? They they like do like things for for movies, like for um, like they do voices for cartoons and such like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I mean, they have they have a right to talk about these things because they because at least he and I think Jay. Oh, they made to, films, yeah. They went to film school. No, I, not just the ones you know, but I mean, they do like industrial things. That's what they do. That's how they. Yeah. That's how they made they made their money. So like they literally are like George Romero when he made Night of the Living Dead. You know, he came from they came from working uh, industrial films, and they're the first people to say our movies suck. It's just trash, right? But, but yeah, but guess what? They enjoyed making it. Okay, you you over there who's complaining about you know Kathleen Kennedy? What the fuck have you done? What have you done? You know, I, I, I will say this about myself. I spent a year and a half making a 90 minute video um, about a, uh, a, a record company and I turned it into like um, a Monty Python show. It was like, uh, we won't get into that. That's something else. It was a long time ago, but I'm not, you know, I, but I just look at, I'm saying, I want, I want someone who I'm like, Oh good. This guy saw a movie that he likes. Maybe I like it. I think that's a positive impulse. Well, I mean, people in our uh, our chat have been saying, you know, you know, that they are liking us talking about films that they now need well, to go track down. it's not a yeah. film, but filling a need. There is always a need for more titties. <laughs> and, you know, JC and I are working on a comic right now. It's all about the titties. There's no purpose behind it other than to entertain you with silliness. And titties. So and titties. <laughs> we have we. I I think there is a way for me to help you sell copies of this. I'm just not sure how. <laughs> by and you two are the only people in the world who know what I'm about to say, which is that I all my life, I've been a leg and an ass man, and since reading Ishi's book, God damn it, he turned me into a breast man. <laughs> wow, it's absolutely true. I was watching something and I was like, oh, wow. And I suddenly went, there's something wrong about this. <laughs> now you like the whole chicken, huh? Not just the, uh, <laughs> well, remember the dark in, meat, huh? <laughs> remember in Crumb? Remember the uh, documentary Crumb? Yeah. And about he says his, his theory is that if you will look, if your mother put you down on the floor uh, too much as a baby, you were a, you were a, a, a leg man because you were looking up. Whereas if she held you all the time, it's like you were a breast man. It's like, oh, here it is. It's right here. I, I'm right on it. And I heard that. And I went, I, I, you know what? 
I think there is some scientific background to that. But um, yeah, we got to. So think of that. Think of a name for me okay. for my show, and um, I will try to think of a way we can exploit that you have destroyed my lifelong love of backsides. <laughs> well, uh, but God damn you. <laughs> well, we will be back next Wednesday to talk more about films. You know, call yeah. it more than just legs. <laughs> yes, we will. And um, before, uh, all right, so as me saying goodbye, I just want to say one thing. Do you know the Call of Cthulhu, the um, Metallica song? The, <laughs> um, the movie they made of it? Uh, there was an indie one. I... Yeah, the silent one. I have not seen it, though. Okay, well, we'll talk about that sometime. But if, if it's great. It's fantastic. They made, long story short, they made it as if this were adapted when Lovecraft was alive. So there's no sound because there was no sound in movies then. And um, oh, wow. yeah, it's, it's really good. It's really good. It's 47 minutes long and the DVD has a lot of extras. And basically they use the technology that would have been alive, been used back then. In other words, to make Cthulhu is stop motion animation. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Okay, yeah. I'm suddenly interested now. All right. <laughs> I mean, I've seen some of these other found films, and they're like, oh, God, I know exactly what boxed effect they're using here. The, yeah. These guys, these guys, they did it right. Um, but we should, we should talk about that sometime after you've seen All right. it. Cool. Well, Thanks for having me on, guys. Again. Join yes. us again next week. Uh, I think we're just going to continue this until uh, I can get my shit together and start doing WordCraft again. And I think when I do, it's just going to be on... on uh, Rumble. I think we've gotten Rumble to the point. exclusive. Yeah, you know, it's just gotten to the point where YouTube's working against us so badly mm -hmm. that we can't maintain an audience that they don't continually I read, get rid of. I read something today that they have a new uh, CEO that basically said, uh, you know, that they don't care about, uh, you know, ratings. They don't care about uh, engagement. You know, because before the algorithm was, as long as you at least had something resembling right. engagement, they cared. Um, mm -hmm. they're, now it's just, no, you're, you're going to put what they want. And if they decide that they don't like what, you, what you're what you putting out, you can go to hell. So, Who, who is that? YouTube or Rumble? YouTube. YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Because I was thinking maybe I should do a Rumble and yeah. we can, you know, we can make an experiment out of it, you know, see what happens. But uh, I will talk to you sometime soon and thanks for everybody who listened in and thanks you too for inviting me on and I'm sorry I only got to three of my discs. <laughs> well, that's fine. I mean that means you got more next week. Yeah. Absolutely. All thanks right. very much guys. Good night everybody. Bye bye. Bye.